Having given other brands the original idea for compact crossover motoring, Honda has developed its own modern interpretation of what a car of this kind should be, this second generation HRV model. It aims at the premium end of the Nissan Duke and Renault Capture class, offering smart looks, impressive safety credentials and the choice of petrol or diesel power. Buyers also get a brilliantly practical interior thanks to so-called magic seat ingenuity and a slightly larger body shape than is the norm in this sector. If you're shopping in this segment and you're prepared to stretch your budget a little, we think you'd probably like one. Okay, stop me if you've heard this one before. We're going to talk here about a car based on a Super Mini, but with more interior space and the raised ride height and funky styling common to the current breed of compact crossover models. In this case, solidly built from a respected Japanese manufacturer and based around a front wheel drive platform. It's the massive selling Nissan Duke, right? No, it's something arguably better. This car. Honda's HRV. The HRV is the model that should have started the current seemingly insatiable craze for small crossovers. The original version was launched in 1999, but they didn't have either the marketing, the peppy handling, or the visual pizzazz that would characterize the segment defining Nissan Duke at its launch 11 years later. That original HRV, marketed as the Joy Machine, was withdrawn from Honda's range in 2006 and amazingly not replaced. It was a wasted opportunity. Still, the brand has learnt from it, with proof of that delivered a decade later with the launch of this second generation version in the summer of 2015. This Mark II model will be a rare sight on our roads, with numbers limited by the Mexican factory's priority to satisfy the American market. Even so, this modern era HRV's prospects are inevitably a lot better than those of its predecessor, and not only because demand for a car of this kind is now well established. For a start, it's based on much more sophisticated underpinnings this time around, those of Honda's third generation Jazz. Unlike that Super Mini, there's the option of diesel power too, although not four-wheel drive. Finally, and possibly most significantly, this car has been very cleverly sized, offering most of the interior space you'd find in a family hatch-based crossover like Nissan's Qashqai, but at the same time, the cute looks and nippy manoeuvrability you get from the more compact Duke-style crossover models this Honda primarily competes with. Add in a cleverly versatile magic seat interior, cutting-edge infotainment and class-leading residuals, and you've a potentially appealing package, even at the kind of premium prices being asked here. Time to put this HRV to the test. For all their protestations of sportiness, most small crossover models are, to be frank, pretty forgettable to drive which is rather predictable when you think about it. Take a Super Mini and then give it extra weight and a high-sided body, and it's not an ideal recipe for dynamic prowess. Fortunately, most potential customers seem to be easily satisfied in this regard, and the result is a bar that's been set fairly low for ride and handling in this segment. Come to this car with that in mind, and it's conceivable that you might be pleasantly surprised by the way that this HRV responds. In fact, right from the off, you have a feeling that it might be one of the better compact crossovers to punt along. For a start, you don't get an especially lofty driving position, even though Honda insists that your eye line in an HRV is 100 millimeters higher up than it would be in a Civic or in a Jazz. That's annoying from an all-round visibility point of view, but it does make you feel a bit happier about throwing the car into a bend. Do that and you'll find a surprisingly high degree of traction on offer, even though this car doesn't have the uh, traction-enhancing agile handling assist system that the brand fits to other compact models. While we're on the subject of grip, I'll also point out that, uh, like many of its contemporaries, this car comes only in front-driven form, the provision of four-wheel drive in this model being limited to the US market. If you're prompted to push on through the corners, you'll inevitably experience a little more body roll than you get in an ordinary hatchback, but it is decently controlled and predictable. 
More of an issue is ride quality, and that can struggle with poorer surfaces. And the lack of feedback through the power steering. I mean, the light response is great in town, of course, but at speed through the corners, it really needs to be a little more uh, feelsome. Particularly, so much else about this car is so engaging. Uh, the driving position, for example, and this lovely snickety shift action of the little manual gear stick. It offers you six speeds to play with, and you'll be getting plenty of use out of them if you go for the petrol version of this model, offered only with a 1.5 litre iVTEC power plant giving out 130 PS. Given that the HRV is based on the Honda Jazz Super Mini, uh, you might have expected it to use that car's 1.3 litre iVTEC unit, but that engine didn't have enough pulling power to push this rather heavy little crossover along. It can, after all, weigh up to 1.4 tonnes when fully fuelled. To be honest, a test drive in a petrol HRV might leave you wondering whether even the 1.5 litre unit has quite enough torque for the job in hand. The on-paper performance stats, rest to 62 miles an hour in 10.7 seconds, en route to 119 miles an hour, look fine, but like many of this Japanese brand's iVTEC power plants, this one has to be revved quite a lot if you're going to get all it's got, an attribute which is rather at odds with the way that many of Honda's more mature owners like to drive. In fact, the modest pulling power on offer, 155 newton meters of torque, isn't all delivered until you thrash the thing to 5,000 RPM. Now, to put that into perspective, the 1.2 litre TSI engine you get in a rival Skoda Yeti develops everything from just 1,400 RPM. In other words, if you're going to push along a bit in this car, you've got to adopt a somewhat different style of driving. Still, at least having to swap cogs a lot isn't much of a hardship given the lovely gear shift action. Why can't other brands produce a gear change as good as this? I should point out, in a petrol-engined HRV, you don't have to have a stick shift. Green pump model buyers are offered the option of CVT automatic transmission, and news that this setup comes with steering wheel mounted gear shift paddles make it sound quite sporty. The reality, though, is rather different. This is one of those rubber belt driven auto boxes, and like all transmissions of that type, it doesn't take kindly to being hurried, emitting the usual strained CVT whine under hard acceleration, despite Honda's efforts to improve things with a more natural multi gear feel. Around town, the whole setup is, of course, far more in its comfort zone and really comes into its own, shifting smoothly and delivering considerably better levels of efficiency than the manual model can manage. Unless you are really urban bound though, we'd urge you to stick with a manual HRV model. And indeed, you'll have to do that if you go for the diesel variant that I'm trying here. The lack of a diesel engine was one of the things that most significantly restricted the prospects of the first generation version of this car. This Mark II model puts that oversight right in style by offering a 1.6 litre ID-Tech unit now recognised as one of the best of its kind on the market. But don't be deceived by the fact that its uh, 120 PS power output is a little less than you get in the petrol version. It's more important to note that it puts out 300 newton meters of torque, so it offers nearly twice as much pulling power as you get in that petrol version. That gives you a slightly faster 10.1 seconds, 0 to 62 miles an hour time, en route to 190 miles an hour. But the real benefit is far more relaxed progress, easier overtaking and much less need for cog swapping. For us, this is the ideal engine for this car. Honda clearly wants this second generation HRV to have more universal appeal than its slightly quirkier predecessor. The idea this time around being to reach a wider cross section of buyers. If you like the idea of a small crossover model but find a Nissan Duke too willfully outlandish, a Peugeot 2008 rather bland and a Jeep Renegade rather ugly, then perhaps this could be your car. The so-called coupe-like SUV looks are stylish enough to stand out without making a statement that's likely to offend anyone. Under the skin, this car is based on the third generation version of Honda's Jazz Super Mini. So there is an appropriate family resemblance between the two models here at the front end uh, with what the brand calls its solid wing face nose design. 
Uh, with this card, though, the flowing black grille looks a little more purposeful, a starting point of distinctive swage lines that flow up the higher set bonnet into the raked back windscreen. The side perspective reveals an interesting piece of market positioning. With 4.3 metres of length, you get a more spacious body shell than you might expect a compact crossover model to deliver. This car is around 160 millimetres longer than the segment defining Nissan Duke. Now, Honda reckons that makes this HRV a viable alternative to family hatchback based crossovers from the next class up, models this car has been priced against. The tape measure, though, suggests otherwise. In that larger class, uh, Peugeot 3008 is longer by 71 millimetres, a Nissan Qashqai by 83 millimetres, and a Renault Kajar by 155 millimetres. However you define this model, its styling certainly reflects the kind of sporty feel that crossover customers now seem to want. The tapering rear roof line, this forward-leaning stance. In profile, you get the usual upper and lower character lines, plus this extra one that starts halfway up the front door and flows back upwards with a flourish into the rear C-pillar that artfully conceals the rear door handles. The uh, tailgate's been carefully conceived too. The original model's boxy corners traded here for sweeping curves and neat detailing. This shark fin antenna, for example, and the roof spoiler with its built-in LED stoplight, and the crescent-shaped lower styling crease that links the rear light clusters. Time to take a seat inside. Now, thanks to plenty of adjustment for both seat and wheel, it's easy to get comfortable here. And once you are, the designers claim that you'll be positioned about 100 millimetres higher than you would be in an ordinary, comparably priced family hatch. Now, to be frank, that isn't immediately obvious. Uh, you certainly wouldn't call this driving position commanding in the way that it would be in an SUV. What it is, though, is very Honda. Other manufacturers might deliver classier ambiences and higher quality materials, but in terms of driving comfort and ease of use, this Japanese brand seems to be more precisely tuned in than most when it comes to creating an at-the-wheel experience that feels just right from the moment you set off. It's certainly very nice in this top leather-trimmed version, but even on cheaper variants, soft-touch surfaces and accented with brushed chrome highlights and piano black finishing and subtle stitching lines do their best to provide a premium feel. As usual in a Honda, the beautifully weighted tiny gear stick falls ideally to hand, while through the three-spoke multifunction steering wheel, you're presented with a prominent speedometer uh, surrounded by circular lighting and containing an empty center section that, well, you can't help feeling ought to be filled by something. This gauge is flanked by two smaller circular instruments. The left-hand one shows revs, while that on the right is a TFT screen that shows key driving data, uh, though it does so using rather low-rent graphics. Many of these features are recognisable from other Honda models, and here's another, the 7-inch Connect colour infotainment touchscreen that takes pride of place in the centre of the dash. Now, provided you avoid entry-level trim, this setup comes as standard, controlling stereo and informational functions, dealing with the optional navigation system, and providing full internet browsing when you're stationary. For that kind of use, this screen should feel just like your smartphone to use, thanks not only to familiar pinch, swipe and tap functionality, but also to a clever mirror link function that allows you to mirror your mobile handset's display and gain access to its applications. You can download your favourite apps onto the touchscreen via the Honda App Centre. And in fact, one key app, AHA, will come preloaded with the system. Now, this gives you access to thousands of stations of audio spanning everything from uh, music to news, uh, podcasts, uh, audiobooks, plus social media and location-based services. Now, the integrated interface should make finding everything from a Twitter account to a weather update so easy that even, well, perhaps even I could manage to do it. And AHA also includes point of interest searches, helping users locate things like nearby restaurants and hotels. It all works very well, our only issue being that the icons on this screen are very touch sensitive, as indeed are those on the climate control panel you get just below the Honda Connect display on most models. 
that makes some of the functions a bit trickier to activate on the move than conventional switches and buttons would be. I mean, you have to be ultra precise touching the on-screen graphics, uh, otherwise your commands are just going to go ignored. Something else that not everyone will like is this rather curious 70s style wide flow air outlet situated ahead of the front seat passenger. It groups three different vents together, each operable via its own rather cheap feeling control tab. As for storage space, well, that's reasonable. Uh, true, the door bins and glove box could be bigger, but you do get this useful concealed area at the bottom of the center console, plus provision of an electronic handbrake frees up space for this recessed double cup holder section. And that features a neat integrated clip out attachment to keep your drink in place. Uh, behind that, there's this lidded box containing a coin tray and a deep cubby. Time to take a seat in the rear, where you'll find that this HRV is one of the most spacious models in the compact crossover segment. True, as with most cars in this class, you'd struggle to fit three adults across the back seat for any length of time, but two people will be more comfortable than they could expect to be in, say, a Nissan Duke or even something more comparably priced like a Vauxhall Mocha or a Fiat 500X. The only slight issue might be headroom. In most variants, this shouldn't be a problem despite the sloping rear roofline, but on a plush EX model like this one, there could be an issue for taller folk thanks to the way that the ceiling height has been slightly limited by this large glass panoramic roof. Unfortunately, the reclining rear backrest that you get on a Honda Jazz isn't on hand to help alleviate the problem. Still, if that's not an issue and you can stretch to a pricey variant with this glass top, you'll get a brilliantly light and airy feel back here that's vastly different from the dark, cramped little rear seats provided by most rivals. What really marks this HRV apart from its contemporaries, though, is the packaging brilliance of its so-called magic seat system, made possible by this Honda's centre-mounted fuel tank layout. This liberates the floor of the cabin and allows all kinds of interior permutations. Let's uh, take just one of them, the magic seat tall mode, where the front of the rear seat base rises up and can be locked vertically in position to leave a cargo height of 1,240 millimetres from floor to ceiling. That allows the object in question to be placed behind the front seats. It's uh, perfect for tall, fragile items, perhaps a bulky item of electrical equipment or maybe a small potted tree you've bought from the garden centre. The other two magic seat settings relate to the more conventional cargo configurations we'll have a look at now. Uh, raise the rear hatch and you'll note the wide cargo opening and low loading lip that pave the way towards a spacious 470 litre boot. Given this Honda's 4.3 metre length, you might not be surprised to hear that this capacity is virtually class leading amongst compact crossovers. There's 30% more space here than you get from a rival Nissan Duke, for example. More surprisingly, this boot is also 40 litres bigger than that provided by a Nissan Qashqai from the next class up. To help make good use of this capacity, there's a recessed area beneath the boot floor, and you can also specify an optional cargo pack that gives you a boot tray with dividers, along with a rear cargo step protector. As standard, you get tie-down hooks and this 12-volt socket. But let's say you need more room and you want to push forward the 60-40 split-folding rear seats to, uh, for example, store something like a bicycle. That's when you move into the Magic Seat System's utility mode. And the first thing you notice with that is the ease of the folding process. Often with cars of this kind, you have to mess around pulling the seat bases forward before you can then drop a rear backrest. And that sometimes has to have the rear head restraints detached too. Or if not that, then you're stuck with a backrest that simply flops forward and just doesn't give you a flat loading floor. Here, you've only to release a simple lever mechanism and push forward from the rear and watch as the backrest and seat base retract together into the rear footwell in one quick fluid motion. 
That creates a 1,845 millimetre long flat floor and a total capacity that measures in at 1,533 litres. Again, around 30% more than most competitors can offer. So yes, you can easily store something as bulky as a bike. And longer items too. Now, if you're not using the front passenger seat, there's the option to recline it as part of the Magic Seat Systems Long Mode. Uh, with that done, uh, items as long as 2,445 millimetres can be accommodated. That could be just enough for more adventurous owners to fit in things like a pair of downhill skis or maybe even a surfboard. Primarily, this HRV is designed to compete with smaller crossovers like Nissan's Duke and Renault's Capture. Models that, like this one, are based on super mini underpinnings. Like some other recent arrivals in this segment, though, it has been priced ambitiously. So ambitiously, in fact, that in buying one of these, you'll be paying the sort of money that would also get you a slightly larger crossover from the next class up. Uh, models like Nissan's Qashqai and uh, Peugeot's 3008 that are based on larger, focus-sized family hatchbacks. To be specific, you're looking at paying somewhere in the 18,000 to 25,000 pound bracket for this little Honda, which slots it into the Japanese brand's lineup very neatly. The perfect stepping stone into the company's larger CRV model. You need a premium of about four and a half thousand pounds to upgrade into this car from the Jazz Super Mini that the HRV is based upon. Let's be honest, that's not a very relevant comparison given this crossover designs, larger sides, and different engines. It's more pertinent to point out that the Japanese brand sells its Civic Tourer Estate for the same money that would buy you an HRV. That Civic model is considerably more spacious, but of course lacks this crossover's fashionable street cred. As ever, it all comes down to what you want. At least the HRV buying proposition is fairly simple, with customers being offered either a 1.5 litre iVTEC petrol unit or, for a £1,500 premium, a 1.6 litre iDTEC diesel. To get the £1,100 option of CVT automatic transmission, you have to avoid entry level trim and you have to have the petrol variant. There's no four wheel drive option, that's limited to the US market, nor do buyers get the chance to specify the kind of enhanced off road traction control systems that are offered by. Peugeot and Fiat rivals. On to the value proposition that kind of pricing represents. Now, as I've already suggested, this isn't the small crossover to choose if you want the very cheapest option in a segment. The least expensive uh, Nissan Duke and Renault Capture petrol and diesel models are priced up to £4,000 below HRV levels. Although it is worth remembering that in both cases you're getting significantly less power and equipment for your money. Honda's objective is to target buyers looking at pricier up-spec Duke and Capture variants. With this HRV, uh, customers of that sort are being offered a more sophisticated choice with better performance but very comparable running costs. Of course, there are plenty of alternative choices that you could make in the sector. A class including several other mainstream small crossover models able to undercut this Honda's pricing by a significant amount. Uh, cars like Peugeot's 2008, Citroen C4 Cactus, Ford's Echo Sport, Suzuki Vitara and the Kia Soul. Any of these contenders could certainly appeal to you, but none of them really deliver all of the technology and driving enjoyment you get from this Honda. Uh, these are attributes that will also help this HRV stand out against more comparably priced compact crossovers. Cars like Fiat's 500X, uh, Vauxhall's Mocha, uh, Skoda's Yeti, Mazda's CX-3 and Jeep's Renegade. All of these will still save you a little upfront on an HRV, but if you take into account this car's higher equipment levels and stronger residual values, there's ultimately not much in it in terms of overall value. As for the Mini Countryman, well, in comparable Cooper guys, that'll actually cost you slightly more than this Honda. Otherwise, there aren't uh, too many other choices in this class, unless you want to save some money but put up with the patchy build quality and uncertain residual values of bargain brand models like Datchet's Duster and Sangyong's Tivoli. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is a Honda HRV that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous the Japanese brand has been with the standard spec. So, time for the detail on that. 
Even entry-level S models come with 16-inch uh, alloy wheels, daytime running lights, auto headlamps, electric mirrors, all-round power windows, an alarm and a neat shark fin roof antenna. Inside, you get Honda's clever Magic Seat system, along with a decent quality 180-watt four-speaker DAB stereo setup featuring iPod-compatible USB jack and an aux input. Plus, air conditioning, Bluetooth phone connectivity, a multi-information display trip computer, driver's seat height adjustment, a fold-flat front passenger seat, a multifunction steering wheel and cruise control with a speed limiter to help preserve your licence through roadworks or urban areas. If you've decided on an HRV but you want to treat yourself to something a bit nicer than S-level trim, then you have the choice of either finding the £1,800 premium Honda asks for its mid-range SE spec or finding a big £5,200 premium above S-level trim and going for the plushest EX variant that we're trying here. You'll need one of these plusher trim levels if you're going to have a car fitted with the Honda Connect 7-inch colour infotainment touchscreen with its DAB tuner, internet radio access and USB connectivity. You also get app integration and a clever mirror link function that allows you to mirror your mobile handset screen onto the infotainment display. As a package, Honda Connect really completes the interior of this car. And once you have it, you have the opportunity to specify the optional Garmin navigation system that's offered at a premium of just over £600. Other highlights of SE trim include larger 17-inch alloy wheels, front fog lights, front and rear parking sensors, heated power folding mirrors, uh, rain-sensing wipers, climate control, leather for the steering wheel and the gear knob, and a package of safety items that I'll cover in a minute. Now, if you can push the boat out and get yourself this top EX trim, there's LED technology for the headlights and the daytime running lights, roof rails and rear privacy glass. Inside, EX buyers get leather upholstery and a panoramic opening glass roof, along with a rear-view camera, an auto-dimming rear-view mirror and a smart keyless entry and start system. Plus, as you'd expect for that big price premium, you get that Garmin navigation system as standard. Whichever variant you choose, the standard spec will cover most of what you're going to need. But if you do want to go further, then your dealer will be happy to tell you about the various key options on offer. We would want to look at the cargo pack, which gives you a boot tray with dividers and a rear cargo step protector. The roof attachment package might be useful too. Uh, it'll enable your HRV to take skis and snowboards, bicycles or roof box. Plus, you might want to consider running boards, uh, puddle lights or a detachable tow bar. We definitely like the 3D sound package that has a compact digital sound processing unit to the car's sound system. This will transform the stereo clarity. And for regular child transport, the tablet holders that clip onto the rear seat backs would also be a boon. Otherwise, the options are mainly aimed at aesthetic trimming and, to be frank, fairly unnecessary. You might like the speaker ring lighting or the illumination pack with its glowing door sill finishes. And there's nothing wrong with the premium pack, which gives you side body trims, uh, doorstep garnishes, smart carpet mats and mud guards. We would think twice about the uh, silvery embellishment of the chrome pack, the sporty bumpers of the aero pack or the SUV style skid plates of the robust pack. Keeping things simple is often the best way when it comes to preserving those all-important residual values. On to safety, where the highlight standard fit feature across the range is Honda's City Brake Active system, an extra cost item on most rivals. It's there to scan the road ahead for potential collision hazards at speeds of under 20 miles an hour. If one's detected, then you'll be warned. If you don't respond or you aren't able to, the car will automatically brake itself to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. And that builds on the usual features you'd now expect on a car of this kind. Twin front side and curtain airbags, anti-whiplash head restraints, Isofix child seat fastenings, a tyre deflation warning system and hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Plus, there's Honda's so-called ACE body structure based around the company's advanced compatibility engineering approach that forms the foundation for excellent passive safety performance. This is 
further aided by the impressively strong basic rigidity of Honda's body structure, 27% of which is constructed from high-strength steel. What else? Well, there's stability control, of course, Honda's VSA, Vehicle Stability Assist System, plus the usual ABS braking setup with a brake assist feature to help in emergency stops. Uh, these will be advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard lights. You also get an EDDB, Early Downshift During Braking System, that automatically increases engine speed to provide engine braking in deceleration, downhill or cornering situations. And there's what Honda calls a fast off feature that maintains engine revs if you come off the throttle pedal too quickly. As you might say if you've pulled out to overtake but you suddenly have to abandon the manoeuvre. Uh, the sort of scenario that might cause a skid on an icy morning. It's all very welcome and this HRV goes further still. Providing you avoid entry-level trim, your car will also come fitted with a package of five other key features. You get a high beam support system that automatically dips your headlights for you at night in the face of oncoming traffic. Plus, there's a forward collision warning system that monitors the distance between uh, you and the vehicle in front and the closing rate and warns you uh, when you're too close. For peace of mind on longer distance journeys, there's also a lane departure warning system which stops dozy drivers from veering out of their lanes on the highway. And a traffic sign recognition system that pictures road signs as you pass them and displays them on the dash. This last named feature drives what is arguably the cleverest element of this impressive safety package, the intelligent speed limiter. Now, from the traffic sign recognition system, this setup knows what the prevailing speed limit is and won't let you break it unless you persist on the throttle. Now, theoretically, that might make speeding tickets a thing of the past. Honda tells us that both HRV power plants feature its Earth Dreams technology. Uh, it's engineering dedicated to maximum efficiency. That, and the fact that this car is based on the underpinnings of a super mini, might encourage expectations of greater cleanliness and frugality than this model is actually capable of delivering. Actually, like all compact crossovers, it's somewhat hobbled by extra weight. One of these weighs around 130 kilograms more than the little Jazz model it's based upon, which is why that car's relatively feeble 1.3-litre iVTEC petrol engine has had to be replaced here with a pokier 1.5-litre unit. This sells alongside a uh, 1.6-litre iDTEC diesel borrowed from Honda Civic family hatch. With both these Euro 6 power plants, uh, the engineers have done what they can to get the most of what's available. The petrol unit, for example, gets a high compression ratio, very low levels of internal friction, a super effective exhaust gas recirculation system, and electronic operation for the variable timing control to optimize valve timing. That's all helped by this car's slippery shape, uh, the fact that there's six rather than five speeds with a manual gearbox, and inevitably provision of one of those stop-start systems to cut the engine when you don't need it, uh, stuck in the lights or waiting in traffic. So that drivers can play their part, this green Econ button is provided. Pressing it restricts engine torque and tweaks the engine mapping, the transmission and the air conditioning for greater frugality. You also get an Eco Assist feature um, that gives you lighting around the speedometer. This glows white when you're pressing on and green in fuel efficient driving that you'll be able to monitor via readings recorded on the Honda Connect infotainment screen. The extra cost Garmin navigation system also helps out with the option of so-called eco routing. The result of all this effort should see the CVT automatic petrol version of this car return 54.3 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 120 grams per kilometer of CO2. Unfortunately, the figures managed by the manual transmission version um, that most people will actually buy aren't quite so good. 50.4 miles per gallon and 130 grams per kilometer. Go for a 1.6 litre ID Tech diesel variant like this one and inevitably things improve dramatically. You're looking at 74.3 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 104 grams per kilometre of CO2. Bear in mind that all these readings apply to a car fitted with 16 inch wheels and will worsen slightly if I have a top version like this one fitted with 17 inch rims. 
Overall, these uh, certainly aren't class-leading figures, but they're good enough to keep this HRV competitive in the compact crossover segment. Where this Honda does have a clear advantage over most rivals is when it comes to residual values. Expect around 46% of your original purchase price back after the industry standard three-year 60,000 mile ownership period, which is a considerable improvement over what you get from a rival Duke, uh, Vauxhall Mocha, Renault Capture or Fiat 500X. The three-year 90,000 mile warranty is better than a package you get from most competitors too. And many customers will want to budget ahead for scheduled maintenance with an affordable package that will cost you not much more than £500. Insurance is rated at Group 18E for the petrol model and Group 20E for this diesel variant. There are so many compact crossover models now on sale that you wonder whether any fresh arrival in this segment really can offer anything different. Refreshingly, this HRV does. It's a touch more spacious than other cars in this class. With superior practicality, you really can make the most of thanks to the brilliantly flexible Magic Seat system that offers MPV-style interior flexibility. Alongside sophisticated design and class-leading safety, this setup aims to justify premium pricing. And if for you it does, then there's plenty else to like about this Honda. Uh, essentially, this second-generation HRV is everything its predecessor should have been. Attractive, refined and efficient too, courtesy of the diesel engine option the Mark I model ought to have had but never got. That car was very much about style over substance. Here, in contrast, we have a much more complete product and one that uh, should continue to appeal even if fresher and more fashionable competitors come along. Honda won't import enough for it to become a mainstream choice, but then this was never going to be a high-volume model. It will instead appeal to those in search of the cleverest and classiest car of this kind. For these people, this car will, in Honda's own words, be precisely, pleasingly perfect.